Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. Page 1091. The man who's writing this is a man called John. Uh, He's in jail on an island on his own, and God has given him a vision. And this is the second part of that vision. After this I looked, and there in heaven was an open door. The first voice that I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I'll show you what must take place after this. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and there in heaven a throne was set. One was seated on the throne, and the one seated looked like jasper and carnelian stone. A rainbow that looked like an emerald surrounded the throne. Around that throne were 24 thrones, and on the throne sat 24 elders dressed in white clothes with gold crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and thunder. Burning before the throne were seven fiery torches, (coughs) which are the seven spirits of God. Also before the throne was something like a sea of glass, similar to crystal. In the middle and around the throne were four living creatures covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature was like a calf. The third living creature had a face like a man and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings. They were covered with eyes around and inside. Day and night they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy. Lord God, the Almighty, who was, who is, and who is coming. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honour and thanks to the one seated on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before the one seated on the throne, worship the one who lives forever and ever, cast their crowns before the throne and say, Our Lord and God, you are worthy to receive glory and honour and power. Because you have created all things, and because of your will, they exist and were created. This is the word of the Lord. (coughs) If you open your service sheets, uh, there's an outline there on the left-hand side. Uh, We will not be doing this as our Bible study tonight, uh, because we like to study the passage ahead of the sermon. So tonight, uh, we're going to be doing uh, God is Trinity, which we've already done a bit today with the Nicene Creed, haven't we? But in this passage, we're going to be looking at God is holy. But I want to start with Australian wildlife. When British scientists first laid eyes on the platypus in the late 18th century, some of them thought the specimen sent back from its native Australia must be a hoax. It naturally excites the idea of some deceptive preparation by artificial means. English zoologist George Shaw wrote in 1799, Shaw was the first to publish a scientific description of what turned out to be a very real creature. Reading what he wrote more than 200 years ago, it's easy to see why Shaw was initially sceptical about the creatures he'd examined. Of all the mammalia yet known, it seems the most extraordinary in its conformation, exhibiting the perfect resemblance of the beak of a duck engrafted on the head of a quadruped. In other words, the creature's beak perfectly resembled that of a duck and the body seemed awfully close to that of an otter or a beaver. It was plausible, Shaw thought, that some punk, I don't think that was Shaw's word, some punk had collected the bill of a duck and an otter or mole's body, then shipped it off to Australia as a joke. It was only with the most minute and rigid examination, Shaw wrote, that we can persuade ourselves of it being the real beak and snout of a quadruped. That was without realising that it laid eggs and then not even realising that its male had poisonous barbs. There's nothing like the platypus and only the most minute and rigid examination helps scientists understand the creature. Now, you might be a little bit different to me, but thinking about the platypus has helped me think about God because there's nothing like him. Some people think he's made up. They've sewed together bits of philosophy and look what we've created. But with rigid and minute examination, we come to realise who God is, don't we? We come to understand how truly unique he is, how deep he is, how broad he is, how wonderful he is. And that's what this series is about, not about the platypus, but it's about God. God is. 
And I think the first attribute we're looking at, holy, is captured most closely in the idea of the platypus because there's nothing like that animal, just like there's nothing like God. Let me pray. We're going to look at it together. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, Thanks for the platypus. Uh, Thanks for natural things that you have created that actually remind us of your amazing nature, your awesome nature. Father, as we dip our toe into the attribute of holiness today, please remind us of who you are, of who we are, and what you have done to bring us to yourself. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, The aim of this series is to just give us a taster of five attributes of God. Uh, We're going to look at, you'll see it there on that preaching postcard, uh, God is holy, God is trinity, God is love, God is just, God is jealous. Uh, The more and more I've worked on this series this week, the more and more I think what I'm about to preach is quite inadequate. Uh, And it will raise more questions than it answers, I suspect. Uh, I want to be clear that what we're doing at the moment is just skimming over the surface, uh, a taster, a spur to a greater appreciation of who God is and what his nature involves and where we stand in connection to him. Uh, One of the most glorious images, and there are a number there at the end of the last book of the Bible, I'm at point two on the outline, Uh, one of the most glorious images that John receives is when he is taken up into the cockpit of the universe. Uh, John, one of Jesus' closest friends, is taken up by God into the control tower of the whole universe and all of history. And there in Revelation chapter 4, he's given a bird's eye view of the whole universe and everything that has, is, and will take place. Uh, He sees God himself. If you've got your Bibles there, we need to be at Revelation 4. He sees God himself, and I hope you're struck struck by how imprecise his description is. Do you notice how much detail he gives us in verse 2? I I, I don't think he can because he's so overwhelmed by what he sees. A God himself is surrounded by 24 thrones on which are seated 24 elders, Uh, There is sound and light and awesome noise and there are four living creatures, almost unimaginable, almost like a platypus, aren't they? So unique in what they look like as created beings. And do you notice what those created beings are doing in verse 8? Day and night they never stop. And what are they saying? Notice they're not singing. They're saying. They're preaching. They're proclaiming. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God the Almighty, who was, who is, and who is coming. There's only one person in the whole Bible described that way, isn't there? And he's described that way twice. We're going to look at both those passages today. And the vision that is there in this proclamation is of the eternal nature and character of God. This is the eternal proclamation the one going on in the eternal heavens. Only God is described with three holies. There is no one like God. That's as simple as it gets. There's nothing more complicated in those three holies. This person is unique. No other being, no other structure, no other thing in all of the world deserves those three holies. It's unpacked when God is described as supreme, Lord Almighty. God is unique and there is nothing higher than him. No power in all of the universe or all history that precedes, supersedes or oversees God. Unpacked even further in the next phrase, who was, who is and who is coming. We will live eternally, but our eternity has a starting point. God is eternal. With no starting point, and no finishing point. He pre-exists and no one made him. He exists now and he is forevermore and will never pass away. That's the eternal proclamation about the nature of God. Wrapped up together, God is unique. And I want us to get that as our base definition of holy. Holy is unique, one of a kind. God is is unique. Nothing else like him, nothing else will be like him, nothing else has been like him. And as these four creatures proclaim this, do you notice that when they do it, the 24 elders in verse 10 also chime in. 
And so you've almost got a call and response as they proclaim this again and again in verse 8. And as they bow down, the 24 elders jump in with their proclamation. Look there in verse 11. Our Lord and God, you are worthy to receive glory and honour and power because you have created all things and because of your will they exist and were created. God's holiness is unpacked and displayed in a concrete way. God deserves all of the acclaim, all of the significance, all of the recognition for his unique nature. Why? Because he made stuff. He created all things and he makes sure none of them disappear. God's holiness is his uniqueness which is displayed by his unique ability to create everything that has ever existed and sustain them in that existence. There's nothing like him. Nothing like him. No one else can do this. No one else can sustain this. Now, in one sense, that shouldn't surprise us because if you're going to label something God, well, he's got to be one of a kind, doesn't he? That's the nature of the word God. There's no one like him because he creates and sustains. But it's not just an eternal proclamation. It's actually an eternal proclamation that takes root in a concrete world. So I want you to turn to page 605 in your Bibles, Isaiah chapter 6. It's the year 740 BC. The year 740 BC, God's people have been divided for many years now. They've been divided into a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. The north is called Israel, the south is called Judah. The capital in the south is that city we're familiar with, Jerusalem. Uh, The dominant power in the region is Assyria. After a quiet period, Assyria has started to flex its considerable muscle. The north has been decimated. Israel has been carted off 722 into exile. Why? Because they didn't regard God as unique. And they had bets all over the theistic table. In the south, Uzziah has ruled over Judah for a period of peace and prosperity. He begins in 792 BC. By 740 BC, Uzziah is what in Isaiah 6 verse 1? He's dead. Now automatically, given what we've just heard in Revelation, that should strike us, shouldn't it? Isaiah is not eternal. (laughs) Uzziah is dead. And by 740 BC, when Isaiah dies, God's people are enjoying prosperity and pride that have been unfathomable for them. In fact, life was so prosperous, they had so many choices that they had decided that God was not unique enough. They'd become satisfied with the world. They were indistinguishable from the nations around them in substance and behaviour. And they treated their relationship with God as an accessory, just one part of a good, comfortable life. Does that sound a little familiar? Assyria's shadow is now bearing down on them. And in the year when Uzziah died, a man named Isaiah was given a vision. And that's the vision we see in Isaiah 6. Look there in verses 1 and 2, and it's a remarkably similar vision to the one that John receives. Remarkably similar in where God is and what God looks like and who's hanging around God and remarkably similar in how imprecise it is because it is so overwhelming. Uh, And then in verse 3, Isaiah hears what these seraphim, which I think are the living creatures, are saying. Each one called to another. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. His glory fills the whole earth. Does that sound familiar? Except it's not being sung in the cockpit of the universe now, is it? (laughs) It's being sung in the dust of Judah, revealed in every day, time and space. God is unique eternally, and when that is displayed in the universe, what happens to the universe there in verse 4? It shakes. It quakes. God's unique nature is revealed in the temporary world. And Isaiah responds to it. Look there in verse 5. Then I said, that's Isaiah, woe is me, for I'm ruined, 
Because I'm a man of unclean lips and live among a people of unclean lips and because my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. When Isaiah is confronted by the eternal uniqueness of God revealed in the now, in the concrete and the dust, what does Isaiah say? I'm in strife. God's unique nature reveals Isaiah's sinful nature. He's a man of unclean lips. Confronted by God's uniqueness, Isaiah is confronted by his own sins, his desire to be God, <laughs> his desire to take that throne that and be that unique. And God's unique nature reveals the sinful nature of Isaiah's people. Did you notice that? I am a man of unclean lips and live among a people of unclean lips. It, it's not just an individual thing, this dealing with God. It's a corporate thing. It's a community thing. Isaiah's sin is not an individual sin. Well, it is, but it's something shared by everyone else in this mob called God's people. In fact, every other human being, when they meet the holy nature of God, and it brings the sentence of destruction, doesn't it? Woe is me, because I've looked at God. I've met him face to face, and I don't stand a chance. When God's unique nature meets human sin, God cannot stand the sin and the sinner in his presence. God cannot stand the sin and the sinner in his presence. We've got a bit of an expansion now of what it means for God to be holy, haven't we? We've seen what it means eternally. It means that God is unique, one of a kind, and he's expressed that in creation and sustenance. And now that one of a kind nature of God is revealed in the here and now, and his holiness is not just expressed in uniqueness, but in purity. Unlike everything else in the created world that God made and sustains, God alone is without what? God alone is without sin. In fact, such a unique God cannot stand sin in his presence. He must judge sin and the sinner. At this stage, Isaiah looks like he's got a short job as a prophet, doesn't he? But he goes through to 66 chapters. So something happens. Something happens to Isaiah when he's faced by this fearsome and awesome view of God. It's there in verse 6. Then one of the seraphim, one of those living creatures, flew to me, and in his hand was a glowing coal that he'd taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, now that this has touched your lips, your wickedness is removed, your sin is atoned for. Do you grasp how amazing that is? <laughs> the unique God, who is unlike anything else in the universe, without sin, who creates and sustains and cannot stand sin and the sinner in his presence, kindly removes Isaiah's sin, forgives it, atones for it. The holy God who cannot stand sin and the sinner in his presence is also unique in how he deals with sin. He forgives it with grace. Now, don't think that means he overlooks it because notice he still atones for it. He doesn't ignore it. He doesn't say your sin is ignored. He doesn't say I've got the celestial broom and I've swept it under the carpet. He doesn't say I've turned a blind eye. He says I've dealt with it. <laughs> it's a reality and it needs dealing with and I as God, I I'm going to do with it. That that's unique, isn't it? God shows grace for Isaiah and deals with his sin in a way that I would never deal with someone else's sin, let alone my own. God is unique in this. And then this unique God does something remarkable in verse 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, who should I send? Who will go for us? I said, this is Isaiah. Here I am, send me. The man who a moment before was saying, woe is me because I've seen God, is now volunteering for God's great commission. <laughs> God deals with Isaiah's sin in grace 
and then commissions Isaiah to do a job for him, which is to go into the world and tell the world about this holy God who can't stand sin and the sinner but forgives sin. Gives him a job to represent him to the world, starting with God's people and then moving out. In fact, the world's not going to listen to him at all. (laughs) When, When you go through Isaiah 6, the world is going to be stubborn. God's people are going to be stubborn. But Isaiah is commissioned to do a job. Having been forgiven his sin by God's grace, God then gets him to represent God to the world. I'm at point three on the outline. God is holy eternally. That means there's only one God. He is unique. God displays his unique eternal holiness by creating and sustaining the world. God is holy temporally in time and space. God is unique in that he is without sin and cannot stand sin in his presence. God is unique in that he acts to forgive the sins of those who come to him. His grace is unique. God is unique in that he then sends these forgiven sinners to proclaim his unique nature to the whole world, even as the world does not want to listen. That's what it means for God to be holy. In fact, when you pause and think about it, that is a summary of all of the revelation of God. God is holy is a summation in one sense of the main line of the Bible. Uh, It shouldn't surprise us if we understand that the Bible is the word of God revealing God. But if you step back, you will see that this is a theme of the whole Bible. Let me just take you through the whole Bible like this. Don't worry, it won't go for very long. God displays his holiness by making the world and then sustaining it. God commissioned humans to display his unique image and nature to the world. God couldn't stand sin or sinful humans in his presence. God consistently approached humanity to deal with their sin and commission them to represent him to the world. This was the case with Adam, who was to go out and garden the earth, filling it with image bearers of God. This was the case with Abraham's family. Abraham was commissioned in Genesis 12, and the nation that emerged from him, Israel, who are saved by God and then commissioned to be his nation of holy priests, In Exodus 19, put simply, they were to represent God to the world by being like God, holy and unique. Adam failed. Abraham's mob failed until we get to the last descendant of Abraham, who is Jesus. Jesus is recognised as a perfect representative of God and he's recognised first as holy by who? By demons. In Mark 1.24 and Luke 4.34, who recognise that he is the exact representation of the one against whom they've rebelled. In Jesus, who is holy, who represents God perfectly, God then perfectly deals with sin. He atones for it in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Those who are forgiven by God through Jesus, like Isaiah, like Israel, are then commissioned today to carry out the very same job. 1 Peter 2, 9 to 10. 1 Peter 1, 15, be holy because I am holy. Can you see how God is holy is a summary of the Bible? And how one day, because of Jesus, because God was perfectly represented to us and our sins were atoned for, we will then sing the same song, proclaim the same message as we see in Revelation 4 and 5. God is holy and his people, forgiven by his grace in Jesus, are to be holy representing him. I'm at the last point on the outline. What does that vision look like? We need to grasp and communicate the nature of God. God is completely and utterly unique. God is beyond all of our imagining. God cannot stand sin and the sinner in his presence beyond what we understand. God is unique 
in that he comes in grace to forgive our sins as sinners in Jesus. No one else but God can create and sustain all the world and the universe. Is that the God you know? How have you spoken about that God this week? This is the God that makes us his people. This is the God who knows our sin and abhors it. This is the God who, knowing our sin, comes to deal with it and make us acceptable to him. This God is not an accessory to our lives. This God is our life. Do you know God like this? Secondly, we need to grasp our nature as God's people. Right throughout his revelation, God has created a people for himself. I hope you saw that in that potted history of the Bible. A people who are sinful and sinners, forgiven by his grace, then commissioned to reflect him to the world. That's us. That's why it's so remarkable that the language of Exodus 19, spoken on Mount Sinai after God's people have been saved out of Egypt, is the same language as 1 Peter 1 and 2. We've had our exodus. That's us, truly, completely forgiven because Jesus' life, death and resurrection is sufficient and trustworthy. We are not doomed to destruction eternally because we have come face to face with God. We can actually approach God, Hebrews chapters 10 and 11, we can actually approach God by the living blood of Jesus and look him in the eye and call him what? Father. Is that who we regard ourselves as? Thirdly, if that is who we are, what is our work Our work is to represent our God by being holy, holy, and holy, just as he is. To be holy is to reflect his nature, his character, and his attributes to the world. He is unique, he is pure, he cannot stand sin, and he exhibits unmentionable grace. There is no compromise in God. There is no half-heartedness in God. There is no lukewarm uniqueness. God is not an accessory to our lives. He is our life. Do we reflect that to our town? Are we a people known for our unique purity, our unmentionable grace, our single, whole-minded devotion to representing the God who claimed us as his own through his boy, Jesus Christ. Let me pray. Father, thank you that you are unique. That's why we can pray to you. And thank you that you are unique in your grace, and that's why we can pray to you too. Thank you that we can approach you as Father. Father, we are sinful. In a moment, corporately, we'll confess our sins, but, Father, please forgive us. Please forgive us for how we do not take our sin and our status as sinners in your presence seriously, how we do not treasure your grace deeply, how we do not represent you most fully. And, Father, having come face to face with who you are in this little taster of your holiness, send us out as your people because of Jesus to represent you as holy in this town so that others will be able to call the unique God of the universe Father because of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Any questions? Elsie. So it's a good question. So uh, Elsie's saying, uh, is, there, is there a way that humans are obeying something like Leviticus can be holy like God's holy? So there's three parts to that. Uh, the first part is placing it in the stretch of Scripture. 
And so God reveals commands there, starting with the Ten Commandments, not to save his people, but so they know how to represent him. Uh, And God knows that humans are going to fail at that point, that they need to rely on his grace. And so they're signposts on the way to who? To Jesus, who'll actually achieve holiness for us in a way we could never achieve by Matthew chapter 5, 17 to 20, fulfilling all of God's law on our behalf. So Jesus is everything that Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy is talking about. That's Jesus. So that's understanding it in the flow of the Bible. So we don't just stay in Leviticus. We move from Leviticus to Jesus. Second part of it is, is Jesus sufficient? Because if he hasn't done everything, we can't be holy, can we? And so then you go, well, God issues us the same command in 1 Peter 1.15, 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, be holy because I have already dealt with all of your sin. So can we be holy? Yes, we can. That's who we are. In whose sight? In God's sight. Eternally already. Which brings us to the next part. What does that look like in daily life? Colossians 3, 10 to 12 says, the rest of your life is now getting used to what God has already made you. Okay, And so the rest of our life will be getting used to being holy and what that looks like in all of our decision-making, in every fibre of our being, as God helps us to do that. In Matthew 28, verse 20, he says, Jesus says he'll be always with us to enable us to do that. And in Galatians 5, we're told that we've got the Spirit to produce the fruit. And then in John 14, we're told we've got the Counselor who will remind us of everything Jesus said. So, yes, can, we, can a human be holy now? Yes, they can, in God's sight. Because of what they eat? No. Because of who they trust in, who's Jesus. Then we spend the rest of our life getting used to it, which is why the sermon ended the way it did, because I want to challenge us, are we actually battling to represent God the way he's already made us in our town? Okay. Does that answer your question a bit? Terrific. Chanel. So Chanel's asked a good question. What does that look like practically? Um, So again, three parts to the answer. The the first part is my get out of jail free card, uh, which is in front of me are how many people with different lives. So what it will look practically for a six-year-old getting really excited about starting school and working out whether to wear a uniform and what a lunchbox looks like will look different to someone who is maybe 84 and recently widowed. Okay, so it will look different in everyone's life. So in one sense, that's why I left it hanging, to encourage us to think about. Secondly, is holiness impractical? Well, no, that's why we had the Leviticus reading. Holiness comes down to what you eat. (laughs) It's that nitty-gritty. It was for God's people, it is for us. Maybe not what we eat, but what we put into ourselves, what we log into, or what our covenant eyes reveals. Uh, what would happen if someone just managed to jump into my computer and see all the screens that I've saved? Right through to all the decisions I make about every other nitty-gritty bit of life. That's why Leviticus 11 is so important. Holiness goes down to everyday life. So thirdly, thirdly, what will that look like for us today? Uh, it, it will mean a number of things. First, it will mean we can face life confidently. Why? Because all of our holiness is achieved by who? Jesus Christ alone. Uh, Matthew 11, uh, 28 to 30, Come to me, all those who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. I am gentle and lowly and kind. I've done it all for you. And I've done that out of my grace. So I, well, I can face each day confidently. And secondly, I can face each day with everything Jesus used to achieve my holiness to face the day. That's why Ephesians 6 is so important with the armour of God. That armour is tested. <laughs> So put it on each day because it worked for Jesus and he's given it to us. Boil that down even more simply, spend time in God's word. If you don't spend time in God's word, you'll never come face to face daily with your nature as a human being before God. And you'll never come face to face with God himself because his word reveals him. And you'll never come face to face with the grace that brings you to God as someone who doesn't deserve that. So what does it look like practically? It, It It means reading God's word. Uh, It means listening to God's word and understanding God's word, like we heard last week, individually and corporately. And then it means individually and corporately applying it to all the nitty-gritty things in life with God's help in the spirit. Everything from what you put into yourself 
to what your plans are for the year in terms of what you want to achieve. Everything from how you speak to how you deal with tiredness. Everything from how you respond to criticism uh, to how you give praise. But that's as far as I reckon I could go at this point. Does that make a little bit of sense? Yep. Any other questions? Beg, I'm going to pick up two things you said there and repeat it to everyone, okay? God is good and God has made us his people. You said those two things and that's part of what we said in the sermon from God's word. Uh, We're going to learn a bit more about the people bit next week when we look at God is Trinity. But God is good and God has made us his people.